the days of Paul's journey from the time that he left Ephesus and, and is trying to arrive at Jerusalem by the day of Pentecost. I told you we're done doing that, so <laughs> it just intrigues me because every time we read a couple verses, the Bible keeps going back to all these short jumps that the Apostle Paul is making. It's going to happen again, but we're not going to go trace those steps. The, the whole point of the Bible doing that is to point out that Paul is in a hurry to make it to Jerusalem by the day of Pentecost, and the fact that when he gets there, there's, there is an uproar that's going to take place because of unbelieving Jews of Asia that are at Jerusalem. And at least if you understand that he did arrive at Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost, it explains why there's Jews of Asia there that are all upset with him. They know him from Asia, but here he is in Jerusalem, and, and they're actually going to cause a problem. Now that's later on in the chapter. Um, but we, we, we got Paul uh, going from, uh, from the coast of, of Asia to the, uh, to the coastline. In fact, I could put a map up. The coastline of the land of Israel. He's into the north. He landed in the city of Tyre. And uh, we're probably not going to get him out of Tyre today because there's just some very interesting things, depending. We might not even finish talking about him today. But uh, we finally get away from a world map, and here's Tyre. You know, this is, it's the border of Galilee, where Galilee then actually reaches up into uh, Syria. And, uh, and, and the verses when you read, sometimes you talk about how the Lord went to the border of Tyre and Sidon. Sidon's on the very top part of that map. In fact, uh, Sidon is 120 miles from Jerusalem. This map is interesting because these little circles, I don't know if you can see them from there, but they, each one represents 10 miles. So, so Tyre here, he's 100 miles from actually making it to Jerusalem. But we got Paul there, and we're going to look at verses 4 through 6 today. But let me read to you 1 through 6 just to get started. It says, And it came to pass, after that we had gotten from them and launched, we came with straight course unto coasts, and the day following unto Rhodes, and from thence to Patra. And finding a ship sailing over unto Phoenicia, we went aboard and set forth. And when we had discovered Cyprus, uh, we left it, uh, we left it on, on the left hand and sailed into Syria and landed at Tyre, for the ship was uh, to unlaid, unlaid her burden. And finding disciples, we tarried there seven days, who said to Paul through the Spirit that he should not go to Jerusalem. And when we had accompanied, uh, and when we had accompanied the, accomplished those days, we departed and went our way, and they all brought us on our way with wives and children, till we were out of the city, and we knelt down on the shore and prayed. And when we had taken our ship, uh, taken our leave one of another, we took ship, and they returned home again. So the whole point is, is that Paul finally reached Tyre, and now the ship is unladen her burden, and he's going to actually start moving on from there, but he's got some time in Tyre, and it says there that they found, they found disciples. And so we're going to study the time there uh, that he's in Tyre and uh, the time he's spending with the disciples. Um, it's interesting the fact that he, he's in Tyre and he says he found disciples. Well, in the book of Acts we can look back and we can get a little bit confused exactly what disciples those are. Uh, for instance, just look since it's in the book of Acts, you can find them easy, chapter 11. And verse 19, this will be, in fact, these are key verses that would actually be a good review. In Acts 11, verse 19, it says, Now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Phoenice and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but the Jews only. Well, that Phoenicia, we just read it over there in Acts chapter 21, well, Phoenicia is this whole area on, this, on the coastline of, uh, of the Mediterranean Sea here. And that's Phoenicia. Tyre is in Phoenicia. And so when it says, you know, when the people were scattered from Jerusalem, ever since Stephen was persecuted, they traveled. And that's one of the areas they went in. And they find it went all the way up. Yeah, Antioch's not even on here. That's they, all, all, off the map as far as north in, in, uh, to Antioch. But when they went in that area, they went to those areas preaching none but to the Jews only. So when you read that about disciples there at Tyre, from that verse, 
you would say they're, they're Jewish disciples. Look over in chapter 15. In verse 3, this is where Paul is now going to go from Antioch to Jerusalem to discuss with the, the apostles the, the gospel that he preaches. And as he leaves, it says uh, in verse 3, And being brought on our way by the church, we pass through Phoenice and Samaria, declaring the conversion of the Gentiles and cause great joy unto all the brethren. So as he passed through that area and talked about Gentile salvation, there's great joy, apparently, that you're talking about Jewish disciples in that area. There's some other things, though, that sometimes when I, when I look at that, and this one, rather than, well, I'll tell you what, if you go to Acts chapter 9, verse 30, I'm going to read to you Galatians chapter 1. Now, someone who's got Acts chapter 9, verse 30, Read it to me, because I didn't go there. Which when the brethren knew, they brought, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him forth to Tarsus. Okay, yeah. So you can't see it there. That's when they, Paul's at Jerusalem at that point, and, and they're gonna, there's a plot to kill him. So they send him to Caesarea, and then from Caesarea he goes to Tarsus. Now Tarsus is way up and, and on the other side of the Mediterranean, way north of here. But when you see that, it, it almost, you almost always assume if he went from Jerusalem to Caesarea that he got on a boat and went to Tarsus across the Mediterranean. But the reason I'm reading it in Galatians is it says, when Paul talks about him leaving Jerusalem, he says in Galatians chapter 1 and verse 21, he says, Afterwards I came into the region of Syria and Cilicia and was unknown by the face unto the churches of Judea, which be in Christ. But they had heard only that, they, that he which persecuted us in time past now preaches the faith which he once destroyed, and they glorified God in me. So that when Paul says that he left Jerusalem, he went through Syria and then Cilicia, and that Cilicia is where Tarsus is, where he was heading to Tarsus in Cilicia. So if he went through Syria, that means he didn't get on a ship, that he actually just walked north, and he met people up here in Syria as he was going back. And so he had contact himself in Syria and Cilicia as he was in Tarsus. Now, in Acts 15, remember in Acts 15, they've had this conference about whether Gentiles have to be circumcised to be saved, and, and the apostles write a letter that, that, that the apostle Paul is going to carry back with him along with uh, uh, Silas and uh, who was the other person to travel with him? Uh, Judas. Um, and, and anyhow, in Acts chapter 15, the, what the letter that they're carrying, it says in verse 23, and they wrote letters by, uh, by them after this manner, the apostles and elders and brethren send greetings unto the brethren which are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia. Now, you know why I'm reading all those verses? In Acts chapter 21, when Paul gets to Tyre, he's going to spend seven days there with the disciples. Are they Jewish disciples or are they Gentile disciples? <laughs> See, there's early Jewish disciples there, but here they're talking about the, the Gentiles of these areas that they're sending letters in. Paul had ministry there, and there's, there's Gentile believers there in that same area. So... All that, uh, I'm not even going to try to solve the problem, and it's not really a problem because it don't matter what they are or who they are. The, the idea is that there's both Jewish disciples and Gentile disciples at Tyre, at Tyre, and Paul now is going to spend seven days with them. They're going to have a good fellowship. These disciples certainly receive the Apostle Paul, and, and I just wanted you to get a little bit familiar with why there's disciples way up there in, in Tyre. And we'll talk more about that and, and maybe some significant thoughts about that as well. So back to Acts chapter 21. Now this becomes a real important part. In verse 4, it says, In finding disciples, we tarried there seven days, who said to Paul through the Spirit that he should not go up to Jerusalem. Now by the way, you're gonna, you keep running into this. They're here and they're going to go up to Jerusalem. <laughs> Jerusalem's always up. 
When they leave Jerusalem to go to Antioch, they go down to Antioch. <laughs> so Jerusalem is, is high in elevation. That's one of the reasons. But it's also a predominant place in God's mind. So, so it's up. But, uh, but the point of the, here, the disciples that Paul staying there with seven days said to Paul, and it says, they, he, they said to Paul through the Spirit, that he should not go up to Jerusalem. Now, we've been studying this for some time now because you recall, and if you, if you don't, you can write it down. We don't, don't have to necessarily relook at verses we've looked at already. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 4, when Paul told the Corinthians, remember, he's taking up a collection from all the Gentile churches. He's going to deliver it to the poor saints at Jerusalem whose kingdom never came and they sold their possessions. And now the, what God's doing among the Gentiles is going to be a blessing to the poor saints. Not, it's not just poor people at Jerusalem, it's the poor saints at Jerusalem. And, and in, Acts chapter, in, in 1 Corinthians 16 verse 4, Paul said that whoever you appoint to follow your gift, they will go with me. If I go, they will go with me. He said, if, because in 1 Corinthians 16, 4, as he was planning to take up this collection, he at that time wasn't sure he was going to go to Jerusalem. He said, if. If you write down Romans chapter 15, verse 25, when he, by the time he writes the book of Romans, he says, you know, pray for me. I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'll be delivered from, pray that I'll be delivered from them. By the time you read Romans chapter 15, Paul had made up his mind, I'm going to Jerusalem. So when he wrote 1 Corinthians, he wasn't sure he would go. He was still planning, you know, to take up the collection and, and, and travel some distance with them, but maybe not all the way to Jerusalem. Then by the time he wrote the book of Romans, he determined he's going to go. And, and, and now we know as he's on his way there, everywhere he goes. Remember chapter 20? You're right there, so just flip back chapter 20 and verse 22. When Paul met with the Ephesian elders and, at Miletus there, it says, and now, verse 22, And now behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth, witnesseth in every city, saying, Bonds and affliction abide me, but none of these things move me. Neither count on my life dear unto myself, that I might finish my course with joy, and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus, to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Which tells you why Paul is going to go to Jerusalem. He wants to go to Jerusalem and testify the gospel of the grace of God. But every, all along the way, there's warnings that, look, when you get there, you're going to be bound. You're going to, you're going to be afflicted and bound in Jerusalem. So the warning is there, but that, that, he's not going to heed that warning as far as that's not going to deter him from going. His mind is made up. But when you come to Acts chapter 21, verse 4, we have to make some decisions here because when Paul finds the disciples at Tyre, he's getting close to Jerusalem now, he's 100 miles away, those disciples said to him that he should not go to Jerusalem. Well, they didn't just say it on their own, did they? That verse says that, through the, that they said to Paul through the Spirit, with a capital S there, that he should not go to Jerusalem, which... To me, is saying if, if you're saying it through the Spirit, that it's the Spirit telling the Apostle Paul, don't go. Now, as you read on, you're going to find out the Apostle Paul is going to go. He's going to con continue to go. There's going to be, even in this chapter, another warning to him about not going. Um, but Paul is going to go. Um, one other person who was teaching the same thing. It, it's interesting to find out what... There, there's always a question when you read the book of Acts... You know, like if you're just reading verse, you know, chapter 20, verse 22 and 23, doesn't mean he shouldn't go. It just means when he goes, he's going to have a hard time. If you look over in chapter 21, verse 10, since we're not going to get there right away, it says, 21.10 says, And as we tarried there many days, there came from Judah a certain prophet named Agabus. And when he was come unto us, he took Paul's girdle and bound his hands and his feet and said, Thus saith the Holy Ghost, so shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man that that owneth this girdle, and shall deliver him unto the hands of the Gentiles. And then the, the people with Paul begged him not to go. And verse 13, Paul says, what, you know, why break my heart? I'm going. I'm willing to not only be bound, but to die. So they, no one can deter him, but there's all these witnesses. But even in verse 10, just because the prophet said his hands will be bound, doesn't mean he shouldn't go. 
So, but when you get to verse 4 there of chapter 21, if they said it through the Spirit that he shouldn't go, then I don't think he should go. <laughs> I, I, I mean, when I say I don't think, I don't think there's any thinking here. It, unless I'm reading something wrong, the Holy Spirit doesn't want Paul to go to Jerusalem, but he's going to go anyhow. Which doesn't surprise me that the Bible always shows the errors in any human being. Uh, there's very few people, I, I'm not sure that it shows... There's, there's two people that you question in the Bible. Uh, Joseph, it doesn't seem to show a, an error in Joseph's life. And Daniel, it's hard to find. There's one little place where, you know, someone can point out that maybe there's a flaw in Daniel's life. But all the heroes, David and, you know, all the heroes of the Bible, God shows, you know, Abraham, God shows their humanity, shows their error. And, uh, and, and here, when I look at that, I, I can't d determine anything except that Paul is, is going to Jerusalem. He's determined to go there no matter what happens, even if he dies. And, and not go, he's not, e even if it's contrary to God's will. And we'll talk about that will in a, in a little bit. But uh, one, there's a couple things that, that, that are interesting to me. They say to Paul through the Spirit. There's no verse that said Paul, that the Spirit said to Paul, don't go directly but the spirit if he's speaking through these men then the spirit is saying it whether he said it directly to Paul himself or through these men to Paul but the, the the reason I even brought all this up I know that some people when they read all this and not really sure whether it was against the will of God or not that one person said that verse 4 is not a command it's a suggestion <laughs> he, they suggested the Holy Spirit suggested that Paul don't go to Jerusalem <laughs> Well, I mean, that's how that person read the verse. So, uh, But what, what he does do does say, and, and it is true, and maybe we'll bring it out more, more, there is in the age of grace, God works up with us, not in, in the sense that he tells us under law everything that we should do and shouldn't do. Now, it does look like the Spirit's saying don't go in this case, but that we, God treats us today as sons of God, mature sons of God, meaning that as, as sons, we make some decisions, and then we live with the consequences of our decisions. We, we, God doesn't tell us, like under the law, he gave them everything they had to do at all time, even told them what kind of clothes to wear, what kind of food to eat. God doesn't do that to us in grace. In grace, we have great liberty, but we're sons of God, we're not children. And with that sonship, we should make right decisions that honor the Lord. And so what they say is Paul's practicing his sonship position here. Well, you can decide on your own whether you think it's out of the will of God, but if it says through, that they said through the Spirit that he shouldn't go, it seems that he shouldn't go. But Paul determined to go. Uh, I want to point out some verses. Look, look at Acts chapter 26. Now, you, you, you know something about the character of Paul and the calling of Paul. First, the calling of Paul. In Acts chapter 26 and verse 16, this is back on the road to Damascus when Paul was called. God said to him, Jesus Christ said to him, to arise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of those things which thou hast seen and the things which I, in which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee, to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they might receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them that are sanctified by faith that is in me. Paul was immediately called to go to the Gentiles. God called him in Damascus, which is, you know, well, Damascus might be on this one. Is this? Where's Damascus? No, maybe it's not on there. So anyhow, it, it's north in Syria, and, and it's outside the land of Israel. God called him and then called him to go then to the Gentiles. And we know he spent like three years in Damascus before he ever went down to Jerusalem and in Acts chapter 9, that's, we, we saw that after three years of conversion, he eventually did go down to Jerusalem uh, and, and only appeared to a few disciples and then, then had to leave. Uh, in, in Acts chapter 22, we're not there yet, but Paul's going to recount something that happened earlier in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 22. In verse 17. One of the other times that Paul returned back to Jerusalem, it says in verse 17, And it came to pass that when I was come again to Jerusalem, even while I prayed in the temple, I was in a trance. And I saw him saying unto me, Make haste, get thee quickly out of Jerusalem. 
See that quickly? Get thee quickly out of Jerusalem, for they will not receive thy testimony concerning me. So the Lord didn't, didn't call Paul to go to Jerusalem. He called him outside of Jerusalem, told him to go to the Gentiles. When Paul went to Jerusalem and he's praying in the temple, God appeared to him and said, get out, quick, get out of here. <laughs> now, even though the God said, quick, get out of here, look at the next verse. And I said, Lord, they know that I have imprisoned and beat in every synagogue them that believed on thee. And when the blood of thy martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by, consenting unto his death, and kept the raiment of them that slew him. And he said unto me, Depart! Didn't you hear me? <laughs> oh, that's my own words. <laughs> for, I, for I will send thee far hence to the Gentiles. Now see, you, you see Paul's desire to go there for his countrymen. But God didn't call him to his countrymen, called him to the Gentiles. Paul goes into Jerusalem, God said, get out of here quick. Paul argues with him, he said, depart. So that Paul doesn't have any business in Jerusalem. He's not an apostle to that territory and to those people, and God is telling him to get out. Now, Romans chapter 9, verses 1 through 3, if you're not familiar with that's what Paul says, he tells us that his heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. That he could wish himself were accursed for Christ, for his brother and his kinsmen according to the flesh. Now, Paul had a great heart for his people. He said he could wish that he was accursed from Christ, meaning that God would not have interrupted God's, with his dealings with Israel, use Paul to go to the Gentiles and interrupt him with this dispensation of grace, that Paul could, if he had his will or choice, or that he could actually wish that I, that I were cursed and God would still be turning to Israel. But the point is, is that his heart's desire was for those people. But yet, that's not who God called him to go to. But we see his attitude toward that. Now, look back in chapter 18 of Acts. Now, I don't know if this is that time when Paul was in the temple in the trance. But here's Paul. He was at Corinth. The first time he went to Ephesus, uh, it says in verse 19 of Acts, of Acts 18, and he came to Ephesus and left them there, that is uh, um, uh, Aquila and Priscilla, left them there, but he himself entered into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews, and when they desired him to tarry longer time with them, he consented not. Now, most of the time, Paul's thrown out. Now they say, stay, and he said, no, I can't stay. But, made, uh, but bade them for farewell, saying, I must by all means keep the feast that cometh at, uh, in Jerusalem, but I will return again if the Lord will, and he sailed from Ephesus. So he was there, and they asked him to stay, and he said no, and he goes to Jerusalem. And, and when he went to Jerusalem here, here's, you know, back up in verse 18, it says, And Paul, after he tarried there a good while, then took his leave of the brethren and sailed into Syria with Priscilla and Aquila, having shown his head in, in Centria, for he had a vow. So he's fulfilling a vow, and he's got to get to Jerusalem and fulfill the vow. And, and a lot of times you read that, you know, I mean, you read that, that this, this this incident here, and everybody says, well, why did Paul do that? And why is he going to Jerusalem? And what, I mean, later in this next chapter of Acts, chapter 22, that Paul's going to act, start the process of fulfilling a vow again, which will include an animal sacrifice in a temple. And, you know, you scratch your head and say, you know, I'm confused. Why is that happening? Well, my, whether we can explain, and, and there's a sense we can, but the point is, if Paul wasn't supposed to go to Jerusalem, and he would have obeyed that, we wouldn't be scratching our head wondering, because he wouldn't have done it. Paul's going to Jerusalem causes questions. It's going to cause a lot of questions when we get to Acts chapter 21 yet, and then, and then no, it's not 22, it's in 21, that uh, some of the events that are going to take place are going to cause us confusion. Uh, there was also confusion earlier in, in Galatians when Peter, after he knew Paul's ministry, left Jerusalem and went up to Antioch, and was eating with the Gentiles and was doing fine until some came from Jerusalem that were of James. And all of a sudden, Peter starts acting like back under Jews, under the law, and brought all kinds of confusion up into Antioch. When Peter went up to the Gentiles, it caused problems up there. When Paul comes down to Jerusalem, it causes problems. And the lesson in that is, is really a lesson about right division. What, what God's purpose for the nation of Israel is different than God's purpose with Paul among the Gentiles. And when you start mixing the two, it causes confusion. 
And, uh, and, and that, just even just knowing that's going to help us as we continue in the book of Acts. So we got that, that there, and, and that statement will linger in your mind as we go through the rest of the book of Acts about Paul going to Jerusalem, should he or shouldn't have, and, and, uh, and, and you got verse, uh, the other verses you know there's gonna, the, the, the prophecy is about problem. Here's a verse that says he shouldn't do it. But he's going to do it, and there's going to be problems as a result of him doing it, not only for him, but when you explain the book of Acts to someone, they're going to have a lot of problems with this. You're going to have problems in chapter 21 as we go on. Um, so anyhow, let, let's continue on. Look at verse 5, uh, Acts 21, verse 5. Now this is a, a great time here. So Paul spent that seven days, and then it says in verse 5, And when we had accomplished those days, we departed... And went our way, and they, the, uh, they all brought us on our way with wives and children till we were come out of the city. And, and, and we kneeling down on the shore and prayed. And when we had taken our leave one of another, we took ship and they returned home again. Interesting, the, the detail there in verse 5, I call it a great family time of fellowship. That not only Paul found the disciples, which I think is just amazing to find disciples at Tyre in the first place, and there's all kinds of disciples as we look at the different verses, but then, then when they accompanied him, they, they spent that time with him, and, and they, they all follow him. They come to the end of the city where it's now going to go out into the country, or Paul's going to get on a ship, either one. Um, but they've they got to depart company, but when they, they walked out there, it's the wife and the children, along with the men, all accompanying Paul, all have a prayer time there on the shore, and, and then, then they depart. And it, I just call it a great time, a, a family fellowship, uh, and then, then when they take, when they depart, Paul's going to continue on his journey to Jerusalem. But the verse said that they went back home again. Well, when they went back home again, they continued their local ministry. Paul's gone. They, they take him, they go with him some distance outside the city. And then, then they have prayer. Paul moves on. They go home. Well, when they go home, what do they do? Well, that's what the local church is all about. You know, Paul went around establishing churches, but it's the people who live there that carry on the ministry day after day, week after week, year after year, to everybody that they can come in contact in that area. That's what we are. You know, we're, we're not traveling people. We're the people who live here, have our, have our homes here, have our life here. And so this territory becomes the area that we minister in. And so, you know, that's what they're doing. Paul moves on. They go back home to continue on the ministry and to con and that ministry hopefully continues on generation after generation till the Lord comes back. The other thing that's kind of interesting to me is to think about, if Paul, it's getting, you know, we've already gone all the timing. Paul's trying to get to Jerusalem how long? Or what, what day? He's trying to get here by Pentecost, right? If those were Jewish disciples who were still practicing Pentecost, they wouldn't be going home, would they? They'd, be, they'd join him and come on down to Jerusalem. So just an interesting concept there about that. Um, and, and I don't know how the Jewish disciples, whether they're all practicing that or not. When Paul gets there, I don't know that the 12 apostles are even in town. But we'll talk about that when we get there. What, what's another thing that we're going to spend a little time now talking about is an interesting fact of Tyre. Are you familiar with Tyre? I mean, the Bible talks about it quite often in the Gospels. I want to point out some verses about this place, Tyre. You'll see it, Tyre and Sidon, referred to together quite a bit. Let, let, let's just get, let's let the Bible talk to us about it. Come to Matthew chapter 11. I think there's a dispensational point to the fellowship that's there at Tyre. Matthew chapter 11, in verse 21, this is the Lord had sent the apostles out, and then he begins to scold the cities. He says in verse 21, Woe unto thee, Cozen! Woe unto thee, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, 
they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. Maybe read another verse. And thou Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which have been done in thee had been done in, in Sodom, it would have repented until this, uh, it, it would have remained unto this day. But I say unto you that it should be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. Now, first thing I want you to see is he's scolding the cities. Uh, it didn't bother. He, when he sent the 12 apostles out, uh, I'm not even sure if they started from Galilee. When he sent them out, they remember they're supposed to go not into the city, not unto the way of the Gentiles, into any of the city of the Samaritans, enter ye not in, but only go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's back in Matthew 10. So the cities that are being excluded here are cities of, of the Jews. And he's comparing them with some Gentile cities that are supposed to be like rotten cities. <laughs> I mean, the re reason I read Sodom, that's Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, there's another thing that's interesting there. The miracles that are being done by Jesus Christ and the apostles in, in, in the cities of Israel, the Lord said that if they were done in Sodom, that that city would have remained. It wouldn't have been judged. They would have repented the idea. That's what he said Tyre and Sidon would have repented long ago. But he's taken Tyre and Sidon and Sodom and linking them all together as evil Gentile cities as compared to the blessed cities or the, the cities that God chose to his son to be revealed in, in the, in the land of Israel. The point is, Sodom isn't, or Tyre, as we talk about that city of Tyre, that's not, a, that's not a good city, is it? That's not talked about favorably by God. It's on the level of, of, uh, of Sodom. Uh, well, chapter 15, you're familiar with the fact that uh, uh, that, that's, where, that's where I was talking to you about the border of Tyre, Tyre and Sidon. That, that's the northern part of Galilee. And when the Lord was in the border up there that way, that's where the, the uh, Canaanitish woman, the Seraphonician woman, came and asked for the healing of her daughter. She's from that land. And, uh, and he said, I'm not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Jesus Christ came to minister to the nation of Israel. Those were Gentile territories and... and uh, and, and those cities aren't spoken well of in the Bible. There's a verse. I can't remember what it is. Hold on here. It was in the book of Acts, so I think I should bring that to your attention as well. Acts chapter 12 and verse 20. can't remember what this is. Oh, yes. Oh, you got Acts? <laughs> you should look at it too. <laughs> I knew I shouldn't pass this up. I couldn't remember why. <laughs> Acts chapter 12 and verse 20. This is where, you know, Herod, he, he killed James already. He tried to kill Peter and, and Jesus Christ, or God, allowed Peter to escape. And then from there, Herod moves on, and it says in verse 20, And Herod was highly displeased with them of Tyre and Sidon. But they came with one accord to him, and having made Blastus, the king's chamberlain, their friend, desired peace between their country, uh, because their country was nourished by the king's country. And this is where Herod is arrayed, and, and it looks like he's shining with glory, and, and he took the praise, and God ate him with worms. He died right there on the spot, uh, which is an interesting thing, because Herod, is, in this, what is happening here, here is Herod, a Gentile king of Israel, who is he's like an antichrist, accepting praise and glory as if he's God, and, and God kills him there on the spot. And, uh, but but the, the people involved in giving him worship are not just the people of Israel, but people of Tyre and Sidon who's there as well. So the, uh, an interesting fact uh, to keep in mind as we consider Tyre and Sidon. Now, go back to Joshua chapter 9. There's a statement made... Two different times, different ways in the Old Testament. I'll just show you one place. Oh, it's chapter 19. Joshua chapter 19. In 
And just what it says about this, in verse 29, it says, And then the coast turneth to, and it's, it's just giving borders, but it just, when it gives these borders, it turneth to Ramoth, Arama, and to the strong city Tyre. I just wanted you to point out, because it says it, and you can write it down if you want a reference to it, it's 2 Samuel chapter 24, verse 7, it says, the stronghold of Tyre. Here it called it the strong city of Tyre. I say that to you because I'm about to share some historical things with you that you need to know that the Bible verifies the fact that Tyre is considered a strong city. It's called a stronghold. The reason why in ancient... Tyre goes back to, to, uh, to 1000 BC. It's been around for a long time. And it was a city that no one could ever conquer. And, and, and so that, that's why the Bible is acknowledging the strength of that. In fact, and boy, this really gets interesting, that there is when David starts making plans to build the temple, he sends to Tyre, and they, they're a wealthy city. They send him some supplies to help him even just put things in store. Later on, Solomon actually is going to build the temple. The first thing he does, he writes to Hiram, king of Tyre, and Tyre sends him gold and fir trees and, and all kinds of other trees and, and sends it down to Solomon. So Tyre did some things that you would say, well, gee, why? Tyre did some things back here in ancient times to help David and to Solomon and to build the temple. And you would think that, there'd be a, that that would be a city that God would bless out of the Gentiles. But something happened. Come over to Ezekiel, chapter 26. I'm going to read to you some verses. And I think I better read them to you so then I can give you some historical information afterwards. But remember, Ezekiel and Daniel wrote in a time in which the na God eventually in the Old Testament had to judge the, nation, the nations of is the Israel and Judah. The, the nation was divided. Israel, the ten northern tribes, went into captivity a hundred years before the f southern two tribes of Judah and Benjamin. But they're called Judah. And Judah is where Jerusalem is at and where the throne of David is at. But eventually God had to judge them. And, and when, when God judged them, Tyre did something. And there's a pronouncement against Tyre in, of, of a judgment of God against them. Watch these verses. Ezekiel 26. It says, It came to pass in the eleventh year, the first day of the month, that the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, because that Tyre, that's Tyrus, which is the king of Tyre, uh, saith uh, against Jerusalem, Aha! She is broken, that was of the gates of the people. She is turned unto me, I shall, I shall be replenished, now she is laid waste. Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Tyrus, and will cause many nations to come up against thee, as the sea causes the waves to come up. So when Judah finally got destroyed, God allowed Nebuchadnezzar to conquer them, Tyre is over there laughing. Ah, she's laid waste. I'm the stronghold. No one can touch me. You guys got defeated. No one's going to touch me. And, and so they're laughing at the fall of Judah. And, and God turns around and pronounces a judgment against Tyre. Now, notice it, it talked about two things in verse 3. It calls them, calls them the isles. And it says, I'm going to bring many nations against thee. Keep that in mind. One of the things that you ought to know is when, when you look at a Tyre on a map, it's not an island, but it used to be an island. In the Old Testament times, back 1000 BC, Tyre was an island. Because it was an island, it, it had ships, and that's especially when you read about Solomon and the gold that was brought in. It's the ships, it's his relationship with Hiram, king of Tyre, that eventually uh, Solomon got a navy, and he actually went out and brought all kinds of things in. Gold, remember the number of gold that he brought in? Yeah, 600 talents, 66, 666 talents of gold, 666, brought in yearly to Solomon. But anyhow, he, he got that from Tyre because Tyre as an island, 
They, they brought, they imported constantly. And, but they also had great wealth and were able to buy, and, the, and then they actually, because of their wealth and because of their ships, they went out and gathered things in, and they became a really wealthy place. They also needed, because they were on an island, they needed things like, they didn't have enough trees to fuel their own, so they had to get inland to get some trees. Uh, everything, all their food, even fresh water, they had to import it. And so they would import, they would make some people rich, but they also made treaties with Sidon, and the Phoenician area that they got an in, they had another city on the mainland that would feed the island land. And, and so they were able to be very rich and very secure because of the, they had an inland and an island city. So they're very secure. Judah fell, ha, ha, ha. And God says, I'm going to bring many nations against thee. Verse 4. And they shall destroy the walls of Tyrus and break down her towers, and I will scrape her dust from her and make her like the top of a rock. It shall be a place for the spreading of nets in the midst of the sea. See the island part there? For I have spoken it, saith the Lord God, and it shall become a spoil to the nations. And her daughters shall be in the field and shall be slain by the sword, and they shall know that I am the Lord. Now the daughters in the field, that would be working the mainland. But either way, it says, verse 7, For thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will bring upon Tyrus Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, a king of kings and uh, from the north, with horses, with chariots, and with horsemen, and with companies, and with much, uh, and much people. And he shall slay with the sword the daughters in the feet, your daughter, uh, thy daughters in the field. And he shall make a fort against thee, and cast a mount against thee, and lift up... Uh, the buckler against thee, and he shall set engines of war against thy walls, and with thy, his axes, and shall break down thy towers. By reason of the abundance of his horses, their dust shall cover thee. Thy walls shall shake at the noise of the, of the horsemen, and the wheels of the chariots, when, when he shall enter into thy gates, as he entered, uh, in, uh, as, as a man entereth uh, into a city, wherein he is made a breach." And the hoofs of the horses shall tread down thy streets, and shall lay, slay thy people by the sword, and by the strong garrison shall go down to the ground. And they shall make a spoil of thy riches. Now, if you read that real close, you started out in verse 7 about Nebuchadnezzar. But remember what it said in verse 3? Is it one nation going to go against them? I'm going to bring many nations against thee. When you get to verse 12 and it says they, it's switching from Nebuchadnezzar's conquering of them to other nations that's going to come in. And they shall make a spoil of thy riches and make a prey of thy merchandise and they shall break down the, thy walls and destroy thy pleasant houses and they shall lay the stones and thy timber and thy, du and thy dust in the midst of the water. And I will cause the noise of the songs to cease and the sound of the harp to be no more heard. And I will make thee like a top of a rock and, shall be a, and thou shall, shall be a place for the spreading of nets upon, upon. And thou shalt be built no more, for I the Lord have spoken it, saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, to, Lord God to Tyrus, Shall not the isles shake at the sound of thy fall when the wounded cry and the daughters... Uh, uh, is made in, in the midst of, uh, the slaughter is made in the midst of thee. And you can read on. Now, I read that to you because Tyre here, God is pronouncing a judgment upon them. A judgment that no man was able to conquer them. You know, Nebuchadnezzar is the one who conquered Judah. After he conquered Judah, he was going to go down and conquer Egypt. But before he conquered Egypt, God put it in his heart to go up against Tyre. And he goes, just like the Bible, just like God said he would through Ezekiel, Nebuchadnezzar goes against Tyre, and for 13 years he was trying to conquer that city. 13 years fighting against Tyre, had, you know, that Tyre, they, they could defend themselves. He couldn't conquer them. The Bible says he was going to conquer them. What's interesting, after 13 years, the way, the way it's told is that the people of Tyre saw they're, they're not going to be able to make this much longer. Nebuchadnezzar is about ready to give up. And so what the people of Tyre did, the night before Nebuchadnezzar made his last attack, the people of, uh, of Tyre on the inland, fighting Nebuchadnezzar, 
decided, all right, let's give up and let's retreat to the island of Tyre. And they all abandoned the city and moved out to the island. The next day, Nebuchadnezzar knocked down the walls, just like it said, breached the city, walked in, and there's no one there. They're all out on the island. Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the city like God said, but never conquered the people because the people went out to the island. Because the people were out in the island, the spoil of Tyre, he never got any money. You know, when you conquer a city, you, you take all their riches. Their riches are out on the island. Look at Ezekiel 29. This is amazing. Ezekiel 29. Look at verse 18. Son of man, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, caused his army to serve a great service against Tyre, Tyrus. Every head was made bald, every shoulder was peeled, yet he had no wages, nor his army for Tyrus, for the service that he had served against it. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will give the land of Egypt unto Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. And he shall take her multitudes and take her spoil and, shall, and take her prey, and it shall be wages for his army. I have given him the land of Egypt for his labors wherein he hath served against it, because they wrought for me, saith the Lord God. <laughs> God says, I owe Nebuchadnezzar. He, he slaughtered Tyre, but he didn't get any money, so I'm going, to give him Babel, I'm going to give him Egypt so he can get paid, right? But... If he never conquered it, I thought, I thought Ezekiel 26 said that God was going to demolish her, slay the people, throw everything down, and make her a, a, a top of a rock, a place of spreading a net. Certainly you, you realize they need dry land. To, you know, if you're a fisherman, you spread your nets on a bunch of empty land. You know what happened? Years later, I don't know, a couple hundred years later, Alexander the Great when he was conquering the world, before he went up against Persia, he decided he was going to conquer Tyre. Nobody could beat Alexander the Great. So he came against the city of Tyre, and, and, and when he came against the city of Tyre, now they're, they're, they're an island out there, and he couldn't conquer. He tried to take the ships of Phoenicia and, and conquer that island, and they defended the island. He couldn't do it. So it looked like he was going to get defeated. He went back to the city, he went back to the land, and he went into the old city, and he took all their towers, he took all their houses, he took all their rocks, he took the dust of the ground, and he built a causeway from the land all the way out to the island. If you look at this map, you'll see the little dimple that's there. That was built by Alexander the Great. And he actually built a causeway from the mainland all the way to the island. Today it's not an island because there's a causeway now. Built by Alexander the Great. And he finally got to the island and he conquered the island. And the mainland, there's nothing left there in the land. It's a place of spreading of nets. It's like a top of a rock. It's everything God said. That's amazing. And now, now that's, we're, we're out of time. There's one more thing I want to show you about Tyre. Because for what we just learned here is why it is when we come to the New Testament, Tyre is talked about an evil place. If, if some of you know a little bit about what Ezekiel 28 is about, Satan's fall and he's called the king of Tyre, you're going to see some relationship here. But for now, we'll save that for next week. For now, what I want you to realize is Tyre was an evil place. But when Paul went there, there's disciples there. There's a great rejoicing with the apostle Paul. And they send him his way and they have a great fellowship on the shores of Tyre before Paul leaves and goes back. You know what the difference is? The dispensation of the grace of God. It's not a time for Tyrus to be saved. It's not a time for Christians and, and, and a church of God to be established at Tyre. The apostle Paul went there and there's a bunch of believers there. There's, there's the grace of God is at work at Tyre. A very unique place, especially compared to where Tyre, not only the history of Tyre, next week we want to talk about the future history of Tyre. <laughs> and you'd be amazed to realize that that place is a group of people fellowshipping because of the grace of God, as the Apostle Paul finds out and as they fellowship with Paul there in Acts chapter 21, verses 4 through 6. A most unlikely place for believers to be established. Outside of Bible prophecy, it wouldn't have happened yet. Salvation wouldn't come to that place until after there was going to be the salvation of the nation of Israel. So, 
that's the history of Tyre, future history next week before we move on uh, in our study of the book of Acts. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we thank you for so much detail in your Bible uh, to these places and, and not just the places, but historical events that took place, but how they center around a plan and purpose that you have, especially as we think about the Apostle Paul and talk about your will, realizing that you had a will to accomplish through the nation of Israel. You have a will that's being accomplished today in your grace. You have a, a will that's going to be accomplished in a future day when you bring your kingdom down to this earth. And Father, we, we thank you that everything in life, all the places and all times, centers around the counsel of your will. And we thank you that we can study your Bible and learn about it. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.